have really suffered a lot. We are still suffering as a result of the uh, economic sanctions undertaken by Western countries uh, and the United States because these sanctions are inhuman, are killing innocent people. Syria's foreign minister speaks out on the decades-long con conflict, rather, in humanitarian crisis that's devastated his country. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. More than half a million people killed, with millions of Syrians forced to flee for their lives. After 10 years of conflict, there's still no end in sight. As world leaders gathered in New York for the UN General Assembly, CDTN's Nathan King sat down for an exclusive interview with Syrian Foreign Minister Faisal Mukhtar. For Mr. Faisal Mukhtar, uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's been a very busy uh, few days for Syria. I don't think we've seen this diplomatic engagement intensity uh, in a decade. You've met with Egypt, Jordan, I understand Algeria as well. Uh, what's the hope here? Uh, it means that uh, we are on the right way. We are open for discussions with our friends and the brothers. Uh, the international community has to come, uh, have come to the understanding that uh, Syria could not be taken easily, neither through uh, uh, military terrorist uh, pressure uh, financing uh, these armed groups with billions of dollars, which have reached uh, something like, I'm not exaggerating, $200 billion. Uh, but they found out that this was a loss of time, loss of energy, and this led to the destruction of Syria, whether, I mean, uh, their intention was this or uh, this or otherwise. But uh, we have really suffered a lot. We are still suffering as a result of the uh, economic sanctions undertaken by Western countries uh, and the United States because these sanctions are inhuman, are killing innocent people. So what's the hope? Uh, what's the way out here? Is it, is it to be uh, readmitted into the family of brothers? I'm thinking of the Arab League. Is it, is it getting uh, like-minded countries to uh, push for the gradual lifting of Look, Western Syria, sanctions? Look, Syria has been established. Because there's still so much to yeah, do. This is a very good question. Syria has been a founding member of the Arab League. And Syria uh, is recognized as the heart, the beating heart of the Arab nation and dreams. Uh, what's very strange is that Syria is not there. And we hope that, uh, I mean, those uh, powers that have uh, fabricated uh, situations that led to the uh, uh, fact that Syria is outside the uh, Arab League uh, are uh, reconsidering their decisions because uh, no complete uh, Arab uh, positions could be taken without uh, Syria. And you have seen how the Arab League itself has suffered a lot of uh, disasters since uh, Syria left it. So we hope they come back to their, uh, I mean, uh, 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 national and pan-Arab interests and take the correct decision. President uh, Assad uh, met with uh, Chinese Foreign Minister uh, Wang Yi, I think, uh, earlier this year in, in July. Uh, how much has the relationship, the burgeoning relationship between Damascus and Beijing aided your situation as you try and find a way forward. China, China is a real international power, both uh, economic and military. Of course, nobody wishes to use the military aspect, but the economic aspect is there. China has supported Syria and the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, more than eight vetoes were casted by uh, China in support of the Syrian people against terrorism for, uh, I mean, uh, uh, ending the uh, inhuman uh, economic uh, sanctions. Uh, but all of us are suffering, I mean, uh, whether in Russia, Syria, Iran, China, among others. Uh, uh, any attack against one of us is attack against all the others, including uh, other independent sovereign nations. So uh, the visit of His Excellency Wang Yi was a very successful visit. During his meeting with the President Assad, he uh, raised a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, issues uh, that both sides have found themselves 
uh, accepting and agreeing upon. Uh, and during my meetings with the Minister Wang Yi, we finalized uh, issues related to the bilateral cooperation in both economic, political, and cultural uh, fields. Uh, we have never been so close with China than uh, this time. You know, China's uh, uh, celebrating its 50th year in, in reassuming its rightful place at the United Nations, uh, both in the General Assembly, but as importantly in the Security Council. Uh, as a veto member, a member of permanent five. When you, when you look at China's role and, and the, let's face it, the great power dynamics that drive the P5, uh, that must be from where you sit in Damascus, a counterweight uh, to other powers. Um, look, China does not like to play a counter role to, I mean, other members of the uh, international community. China has, since the beginning, believed that international cooperation on very important issues is vital for a positive role of the United Nations. But when some countries like the United States, uh, some European countries, are pushing the UN to play from outside the charter of the United Nations and to attack other countries and to uh, impose sanctions, inhuman sanctions against other countries, including on China and Russia, and other Syria and other countries, then China has never wavered uh, to say the truth, that uh, such policies uh, do not help the role of the, uh, promoting the role of the United Nations. Uh, rather, the, this means uh, going back. A uh, few days ago, we met in the uh, Venezuelan mission, uh, 18 countries that have uh, vowed uh, to protect the United Nations Charter. Mm. Because the Charter is under real threat. Mm. I mean, all moves from Western countries are bringing new issues that allow their interference in third world countries, developing countries, sanctioning some countries, are running against the Charter of the United Nations. Against the multilateralism, yes, against so the sovereignty. Against multinationalism, against the sovereignty and independence of countries. So now, uh, we are rallying other countries to join this effort to preserve the Charter of the United Nations, the uh, principles and the uh, noble ideas uh, enshrined in the uh, Charter. Uh, and I am sure uh, China, Russia, among others, can play a very important role in this group. Uh, during the uh, conflict in Syria, obviously, you talk about uh, groups of terrorists, but uh, on the Syrian side, you had Russian intervention. They were invited. <laughs> uh, and, of course, uh, the influence of Iran uh, and others. How do you see a place where uh, the support that you've had is not necessarily needed anymore as you emerge uh, from the conflict? And essentially, every power wants to be sovereign. Uh, and may have friends, but essentially once... You know, uh, uh, I mean, as you said, we invited uh, Russia to help Syria against uh, terrorist groups. No other nation, no nations, I mean, would like to be present on other territories if they don't have some ambitions. In the case of Russia, we have common goals and objectives. We have to preserve the peace in the Middle East. We have to, pre to, to, to defeat the terrorist and other armed groups to end... Uh, foreign interference in the internal affairs. So uh, I am sure uh, that uh, on such a strategic issues, there will always be an agreement between the Syrian government and the uh, Russian government. Russia has never intended to preserve a, a presence that will violate the sovereignty of the country. On the contrary, they have been fighting with us, sacrificing a lot of lives from Russian soldiers to protect Syria, its sovereignty and independence. It's a difficult time for uh, Syria because not just the ravages of uh, a decade-long war, but also the ravages of climate change and COVID, which of course have dominated uh, the UNGA here. How has Damascus coped considering all the extra burdens that were on you as well? This is a very good question. Uh, we waited uh, a lot of help and support from the international community. Uh, Syria was really ravaged uh, by the terrorist actions who have destroyed a lot of our factories, a lot of our heritage, historical heritage, a lot of our uh, infrastructure everywhere in Syria. 
because Syria has a very good reputation for healthcare and doctors. Absolutely, and we, we did not need anybody. We were exporting doctors and healthcare and medicine and everything. But now, because of the sanctions, because of the devastation that was caused by the terrorist groups, we are suffering in all these fields as a result of the direct uh, imposed uh, unilateral coercive measures because the United Nations has impo imposed no sanctions on Syria. It is, in fact, American and European sanctions. Uh, and they are trying to influence the achievements we scored uh, throughout our military forces, throughout our people who have resisted all terrorist uh, attacks and all interventions by uh, well-known countries in the internal affairs of Syria. So uh, I can tell you that uh, with all the possibilities and help given to us from China in particular, because more than one million uh, shots of uh, uh, fighting COVID-19 uh, were given to Syria by the Chinese uh, government, of course, free of charge. And we received some help from the uh, Russian Federation uh, also and from the United Nations, but after a lot of efforts. We hope to receive more, and China has expressed its will to give us more, not only in terms of combating uh, COVID-19, but in terms of uh, enhancing uh, economic development in uh, Syria and rebuilding the country after the devastation that was caused by the terrorist groups and their supporters. Um, there's a lot of Syrians not in Syria anymore, as you know, uh, in major um, countries around uh, Syria. I'm talking about the refugee problems, obviously, in Lebanon, in, in Turkey, and elsewhere. As you meet more and more of your neighbors and reconnect with them diplomatically, what is the plan and the hopes for returning Syrians to Syria? Without any condition, Syrians can return back uh, home. But as you have said before, uh, how can they return with uh, safety while very severe and human uh, uh, sanctions are being imposed on the country? A refugee has to return to find a suitable house, uh, to find, uh, I mean, modest uh, economic uh, possibilities, to find work, to find the schools, to find medicine, to find all these things. And now all these aspects are under American uh, sanctions. This is one difficulty. When it comes to us, President Assad has issued a lot of decrees uh, giving amnesty to those even who, who committed certain actions against the uh, safety of citizens. And uh, But we don't find encouragement by the international organizations, including in the UN system, calling for these people to go back. They are telling them no. The situation is not ripe yet for you to return. All refugees in the world are given incentives. I mean, a lump sum of $5,000 for each family to go back. Then with this lump sum of money, they can rebuild their house if it is, uh, the, I mean, affected by the developments or can run a project, uh, I mean, a smaller project for uh, life saving. Uh, in, in all these cases, the UN has refused upon demands from the donors to give any assistance to these refugees. And the country coming out of war, a country facing all these sanctions cannot offer any more. So uh, what we want the international community to do is to help these people come back. But on our part, they are welcome without any preconditions. Serious Foreign Minister there. There's a lot to talk about. Let's get right to our panel. Ali Akbar Dareni is a researcher and writer with the Center for Strategic Studies in Tehran. Ibrahim Hamidi serves as the senior diplomatic editor as, at Ashok al Aswat. That's a London-based international Arabic uh, newspaper. And also joining us is Cenk Karatash. He's a journalist and senior political analyst focusing on Turkish political affairs. Cenk, I want to start with you, and I want to talk a little bit about this interview, but I also want to talk about his address at the UNGA today, where he made some assertions about uh, Turkey, uh, basically saying that they're not standing up to the agreements made in Sochi and Astana. He also called on the UN Security Council to intervene to stop these Turkish incursions. And he basically said Turkey's trying to kind of carve off the, the northern part of Syria and turn it into a Turkish state. I want to get your reaction. Thank you, Mike. Uh, 
It seems to me that the Syrian foreign minister said whatever he is expected to say. We've been listening to these for a long time now, and it seems like we're going to continue hearing these statements from the leaders from both sides. The fact of the matter is that there is no solution in the horizon. These kind of statements help no one, especially the Syrian people. So at the moment, it is true that Turkey is a part of this quagmire, but it occurs to me that it is not the same uh, as five or 10 years ago what Ankara is thinking. Now, the, the, the perception of Syrian issue for Ankara has been evolving, as it is for most of the actors. Right now, I believe that Ankara wants to put this put an end to this uh, crisis in a way that is beneficial for all sides, but it's not clear how to do it at the moment. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because they'll have a chance to kind of state their position uh, later this week. Uh, Erdogan meeting with Putin in Sochi. What do we expect to come out of that meeting? That will be a very interesting and important meeting in Sochi this Wednesday. Um, let's be honest, the Syrian game at the moment is a Russian game. and. Um, we should expect some clarification as to how we proceed in this. Um, in that context, Erdogan would like to use his warm relations with Putin as kind of like a leverage against his uh, relations with the West. But at the same time, um, Turkey is in a bad position in terms of its economy. And after the COVID now um, and the looming elections for Erdogan, a uh, Syrian issue is something that he wants gone as soon as possible, especially from a refugee perspective. There are almost 4 million Syrians who are in Turkey, and uh, they came as guests. However, there is no um, expected date for them to leave, and it's becoming not only a social problem, but also a security problem, and it's actually negatively impacting Erdogan's popularity in Turkey. Ibrahim, I want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, this address, but also the interview uh, with uh, Nathan King. Uh, he came across as rather assertive, um, as did uh, Assad after the election in May, where he came out and basically conveying the message, you know, that uh, Syria is uh, resilient after 10 years of war. And we kind of heard the same thing from the foreign minister as well, saying we're on the right way, pointing out that Western forces poured about $200 billion into these efforts and, and Syria took the punches and, and all they have to show for it is a loss of energy, money. And, uh, and so on. What's the goal here in, in meeting with the international community, coming out uh, with their message, and then also meeting with some of uh, the neighbors? Uh, what do you see uh, as, as the end game here? Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, uh, I mean, definitely, definitely there is a change in terms of how neighboring countries and some of the international community uh, uh, officials dealing with Damascus. Uh, 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 this time, I mean, Magdad, I think, as foreign minister, was the first time to be there representing the Syrian government. And he met with uh, some Arab foreign ministers like the Egyptian, Jordanian, uh, uh, Tunisian, I think, the first time in 10 years that, uh, that such meeting took place since the Syrian government was uh, expelled from the Arab League. That is correct. But to be very honest and fair, that is part of the story. The other part of the story is that uh, we should not forget that, I mean, we, we have to take into consideration the state of play on the ground. Uh, I mean, Syria is divided for three zones of influence. One is controlled by the Russians, Iran, and the Syrian government, 65 percent. The second zone is controlled by Turkey and Islamist Syria opposition, 10 percent. And the rest is controlled by SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces, Kurds and Arabs, supported by the Americans. So Syria is divided, A. B, we have five armies involved in Syria, the Russian, American, Turkish, Iranian, and the Israelis. Uh, three, I mean, half of the Syrian population, as you mentioned in, the, in your introduction, in your introduction, half of the Syrian uh, population flee their homes, either as internally displaced people or as refugees. Just imagine, like, just to make uh, some comparison, just imagine 700 million of uh, Chinese flee their country. Half of the Syrians flee their own homes. Now, that is the reality. Now, after 10 years, 
what I notice as a Syrian observer is that there is a change of tone. There is a change of tone. There is a change of tone among neighboring countries, except Turkey, and the international community. The Americans used to block any kind of normalization with Damascus. That is not the case anymore, which encouraged neighboring countries like Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon, Egypt, to normalize with Damascus. Mm. How, how far that will go, that re remain to be seen. Right. Interesting. Uh, Ali Akbar, uh, let me ask you about uh, this sense that we're getting from the foreign ministry that, you know, basically they've turned the corner, but there's still fighting going on, as uh, he just pointed out. In fact, in northern Syria, uh, right around Idlib, we're seeing more airstrikes from Russia. How would you describe the scene on the ground? Well, um, the Assad government is uh, intent on uh, completing its victory by uh, liberating the remaining uh, land which is still under uh, occupation by terrorist groups and also uh, to get Turkey to leave uh, the northern parts of Syria. But it understands that it has to uh, go through negotiations uh, because uh, all international actors have have come to the conclusion that uh, uh, the solution to the Syrian problem is not uh, terrorism, is not uh, uh, armed conflict, but a, a political dialogue to to reach a peaceful solution at the end. But uh, in in general, I see uh, Syria as a victim of international power politics and of its own mistakes. By saying international power politics, I mean, when uh, the conflict began, when the, uh, the civil war erupted in 2011, uh, uh, you know, uh, many uh, countries uh, got involved in the conflict. Opposition supporters took up arms and foreign powers took sides, sending weaponry, terrorists, fighters, and money. Uh, that conflict, uh, you know, uh, continue, has continued for a decade. Uh, but that is uh, partly a design by the Americans, as revealed by retired four-star General uh, Wellesley Clark, when he said that uh, the Bush administration began uh, its plan to take out seven countries in five years' time. But the, the Iraq war disaster... Uh, forced the United States to change its policy. So uh, while it, it started with Iraq, it did not go uh, with Syria militarily. Instead, the, uh, the conflict in Syria gave uh, the, the Americans and, and uh, Syria's enemies a perfect justification to, uh, to weaken Syria inter internally. The goal of toppling President Assad has failed. But Syria's enemies yeah. did succeed in weakening Syria uh, killing its people, yeah. displacing its people, and destroying its infrastructure and cities. So, Cenk, who were the big loser, losers uh, in this conflict? The Syrian people. Yeah, Jenk, let me ask you about this. The foreign minister, again, uh, being rather up, upbeat about all of this, but uh, you know, you listen to the UN Commission of Inquiry of Syria, their assessment much more dire. Let's listen to what they had to say. We look at different parts of the country and we see. The levels of violence and, the, and fighting are going up rather than down. And then we look at the whole country and we see the economy plummeting. We see um, um, sh food shortages and, uh, as we said earlier, 12.4 million insecure. We see fuel shortages. We see the pandemic hitting and the numbers rising. What is really pathetic in this 21st century that the past months have seen the return of sieges and siege-like tactics in Dara, in Conetra, and the Rif Damasco governorates. When we were reporting about sieges, we have the, the hope that the years to come, the sieges will disappear, but that is not uh, the case. Cenk, uh, that description just rather dire. Uh, and in the near term, I mean, this is a country still dealing with these twin threats, war and the pandemic. Uh, what's it look like there in Syria? Now, uh, when I look at it from the Turkish perspective, there is nothing more that Turkish President Erdogan would like to do than to rebuild Syria and assist it in doing so. 
And we know that there are a certain interaction between Damascus and Ankara, especially through intelligence agencies. But it's mostly because of Russia that Ankara feels the pressure to normalize things. Now, um, from the Turkish border, the issue is like, uh, the refugees, the Syrians, who are piled up to the borders, and everybody is calling each other terrorists constantly. Now, the thing is, um, there has been an escalation of Russian military activity, especially in Idlib region. And if it turns, the, turns out to be a victory for the Syrian government, then that would mean a new wave of a refugee influx into Turkey that cannot be accepted. So that is why there has to be a middle ground. Now, this is the tragedy of humans uh, above anything else. So for Turkey to end this uh, kind of like a clash, there has to be some kind of a reasoning for the Kurdish controlled Kurdish control areas in northeast Syria so that the perception of security threat from Syria would be eased. But at the same time, there must be a path for the Syrians to go, go back to their country. Yeah, Turkey has its troops in Syria as well. It's active militarily. In the beginning, it was not the plan. It, it, it uh, sounded like a relatively easy undertaking uh -huh. to, be, uh, to take a part of this reshuffled deck in Syria. Uh -huh. But now, the troops in Syria doesn't they don't look like they want to uh, actually invade the place but right. it's like a buffer zone like a safe zone that right. Erdogan's always talking about yeah Ibrahim I've got time for one more question uh, briefly if you can I saw you uh, talking about uh, Syria at, a, at an event a few years back and you said in the Middle East if you have two predictions always pick the worst one um, I want to get your prediction on the future for Syria you know we've heard about political dialogue is there a political solution in the future, or, or is it far more dire than that? I, uh, I, I, I don't think there is any political solution for that. I think I will be naive to think about that there will be a political solution. You know, the whole crisis is... Uh, uh, so the whole crisis is started uh, uh, by the uh, peaceful demonstrations, but then uh, uh, hijacked by regional powers, international stakeholders. So now uh, Syria is completely the Sir Syria and Syrians are hijacked by international uh, uh, and regional uh, race and struggle for power, and the Syrians are paying a price. I don't Syria coming back to to be a normal country anytime soon. Syria will remain divided, uh, suffering, destroyed, and the same people will uh, suffer for a long time uh, uh, before we have a stable Syria. It's going to take long, long, long time. All it's right. bad the news, we're, but this is how I see it. We're going to have to leave it there. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter, Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.